Good morning, folks, or good afternoon, depending on your time zone. Thank you very much for uh, carving the time out of your busy days to learn a little bit about uh, GIMP. Uh, GIMP is a, uh, an abbreviation for the GNU Image Manipulation Program. Um, like many open source projects, the GIMP started out with a, um, a good idea, um, a goal. The goal was to find an open source replacement for Photoshop. Uh, for any of you who have used Photoshop or any of Adobe's uh, programs, you know that they are very powerful and also very expensive. Um, a lot of us in the Linux community are always looking for uh, lower cost ways of doing things. Uh, and uh, the GIMP certainly uh, filled that requirement for me. So John gave a nice uh, bio and background. Uh, one of my other hobbies has been photography. Back uh, back in the old Kodachrome days, I was uh, carrying around a, a Minolta and then a Nikon and um, finally made the conversion to digital probably about uh, 2007. Um, at that point, I had already been familiar with uh, some of the photo manipulation tools that were available, but uh, it became even more important when I moved to uh, digital. So I'll start by, um, if we can get my slides to advance here. Here we go. So what we'd like to do today is, is introduce you to the GIMP, um, tell you a little bit about it, just a, a brief overview, and give you some ways to think about how you could use it if you are already not using it or if you've tried it uh, a few years ago and kind of gave up. Um, when you leave here today, you won't be a GIMP expert, but you will, I hope, find a couple of ways to uh, make your life easier when it comes to either photo editing or in some cases simply converting a file from one format to another. Also, I hope to give you some, uh, some thoughts about um, uh, photography in, in general. Um, and as John said, happy to answer your questions at the end of the presentation. So the GIMP project is very feature rich, very powerful. Um, that's one way to say it's also a pretty complex program. The interface is light years better than it used to be, but it is um, not always intuitive. So sometimes there's a learning curve when you start this. Uh, but most features, if you hover over the uh, uh, the button or the uh, drop down, it'll give you a little bit of information. Um, as with most programs, if you hit F1 or go to help, there is a, uh, a very deep, detailed uh, set of information that will help guide you through it. And I will give you some links at the end. There are some wonderful tutorials, which is also very common with open source software. Um, lots of folks using it and helping others use it by documenting their efforts. So first of all, the GIMP is free. Open source software uh, by nature is typically free. Sometimes companies will charge for support, but there is no cost to download or to use. If you want to make changes, you're free to do that. The only uh, uh, stipulation is we ask that you uh, give the changes back to the community. Uh, so if you, if you want to improve the software, you're free to do that. You're free to see the source code uh, to look to make sure that before you load it on your computer, you're comfortable with, uh, with what it does. One of the nice things I like about the GIMP is it is cross-platform compatible. So if you have a Linux computer, if you have a Mac computer, if you have a Windows computer, it runs on all of them. Um, the interface is almost identical, which is, uh, which is great. Um, the GIMP uses a plugin framework. That is, there are many, many different granular features, uh, but they can be used in a scripting format, if you will, that will, when combined, create an effect. So for example, if you're using a smartphone you prop in some sort of photo um, app on your phone, or maybe it's embedded in your uh, smartphone operating system, uh, you'll have filters. It'll say warm, cool, um, sunny day, HDR, something like that. And, and so uh, you have that same capability within the GIMP. There are pre-programmed uh, 
filters out there, or you can make your own. Uh, one that I've used many times is just the old photo look. So you click on one button, and it will give you the sepia tones, the uh, the crinkly sort of uh, look, uh, even um, kind of tear the edges uh, in some cases. One of the first ways I started to use the GIMP is as is, is as a file conversion tool. There are many, many different uh, file formats out there for photos, some with different functionality. Um, and if you're doing web design in particular, you may find that you need one versus the other. Um, JPEGs, very common format. Um, many people, when you're shooting with a digital camera, will get the, the JPEG file. Uh, but a JPEG is compressed. It also doesn't have transparency. So for example, if you have a, uh, a boxed in picture, a rectangular picture with a portrait, the w background is white and you want the background of the web page to show through, you wanna make that white transparent. So you're gonna have to convert that from JPEG to some other file format. The native um, format for GIMP is the XCF. It will save all of your operations. Uh, we haven't gotten in, into the commands yet, but if you operate on an image and you do 10 different things, all of those will be saved as history in the XCF format. Uh, from there, you're free to output or uh, export in whatever file format you like. And again, most commonly for, for most of us, that's JPEG. So the basic flow with the GIMP is to first select your target. Um, what is it that we're going to operate on? We can operate on the entire image, and some examples there might be to uh, flip the image, re, you know, invert it, um, rotate it. We can select a layer, a portion of that image, or we can just pick a thing. The thing can be uh, a circle, it can be a square, it can be a color, so you can select just the blue in a file. Um, from the in the next um, the next uh, selection here, I, I, I'm reusing the word. The next operation would be the selection. How do you pick it? What do you use to select the device or the portion that you're going to operate on? Um, we'll see some screenshots where you'll have a tool menu on the left and you can draw a circle, for example, you can use a freehand tool. Um, as I mentioned, you can select by color or there is something called a fuzzy select, which I really like. And if you look at the uh, picture in the lower right hand corner, if I were to select that, that the background looks very blue, right? It is not consistently blue. So if I clicked on select by color, because I wanted to change the sky color or, or manipulate it in some fashion, um, it might not pick it all up. So the fuzzy select would pick it all up and the hawk would be isolated. Next, we, we pick the action. What is it that we want to do? So we've selected the color and we want to make it go away. Let's say we want to desaturate that color. We want to, to make the background white. We want to cut away the background because we're going to trans, uh, replace it with a transparent layer, for example. So you have many, many, many different types of operations you can do, many actions available once you make your selection. So let's jump into it a little bit and see if we can make sense of it. On the left, you'll see that toolbox menu that I mentioned. And this is where you're going to use the tool that is appropriate for your uh, particular need. Uh, so you can draw a box within your image and then cut the box out. Uh, you can use a paintbrush, an eraser, um, several different kinds of paintbrushes. And for each selection, on the right, you'll see a, uh, a an, an additional menu. Now, in this case, I've selected a paintbrush, and you can see many, not, not all, because they won't all show up without scrolling. On the right, you'll see many of the brush options available. So if you want to have a, a sort of an airbrush look, you can do that. 
Um, you can have a very hard line and you can certainly adjust the size and the opacity. So for example, if I want to just kind of smudge something a little bit or I want to um, uh, operate on a, on a blemish on, on something, but I don't want to make it very bold, you can make the operation that you're doing kind of transparent. You can set it at 20%, for example, versus 100%. So lots and lots of options. So some of the really commonly used features, very simple one is crop. So you take a picture and you see somebody poking their head in the picture or there's a uh, some some distracting element that you had hoped to get it right in the camera. That's always the goal, right? We, we want to do everything we can to compose and expose the picture properly. But Murphy's Law prevails. It did for me this morning, by the way. But a crop will help you very easily get rid of something you don't want. So in a, in a crop situation, you grab a rectangular, typically, um, tool, draw it to the size that you want, and then select, in this case, the image, because that's the thing on which we're operating, and you hit crop to selection. So anything outside the box goes away, and you have a nicely framed picture exactly the way you wished you had taken it the first time. Curves is another one I use a lot. Curves does two things. It helps me adjust the exposure because I, I underexposed, I overexposed, and it does it in a nice, nice smooth way, uh, better in my book than just grabbing brightness or contrast or, or fiddling with both. Um, curves is really handy for cloudy day shots. Um, if the day is overcast, if there's a lot of moisture in the air, you'll get this, this kind of haze over everything. Adjusting the curves slightly gets rid of that haze. It's, it's really a lifesaver. If you've taken a picture that you're not going to be able to reshoot easily, or if you're not, um, uh, you just can't recreate that scene again, uh, this will help fix that. Another one that I typically use is to resize an image. Uh, very often I'll take some pictures that need to go elsewhere and for whatever reason bandwidth is limited. So I don't want a five megabyte file flying around the internet or multiple five meg files. So you can simply scale the image down. Um, if you're not printing a magazine you probably don't need that level of resolution and certainly if it's going on a web page or in a document Scaling it down will help you save space. Another common tool that I use is uh, flipping the image, rotating it slightly or inverting it. Um, sometimes it will help with comp uh, composition, uh, but in many cases you're simply trying to uh, uh, overcome a mistake. Right? Red eye removal is one that we get into a lot. Um, if you have, uh, if you use the camera's built-in flash, you're very often going to get red eye because you're, the light in the subject's eyes on their retinas is going to be reflected back into the lens. And that retina is full of red blood cells, so you get red light back. Uh, and very often, the subject's pupils are very big. Sometimes um, sophisticated uh, flashes, whether on a cell phone or on a camera, will uh, flash a few times before actually taking the picture. The reason that we do that is to narrow those pupils a little bit so we don't get so much red eye. Um, if you can get the flash off the camera, that's a great way to do it, but sometimes that's not an option. So there is an, an automatic red eye uh, removal function. It works extremely well. Uh, cloning is a tool that I use very, very often, and I'll tell you why. I do um, some landscape photos um, fairly often. I have a very wide-angle lens, and when, when you do a wide-angle shot and you have a lot of sky, any speck of dust on the lens at 17 millimeters is going to show up. Um, it is very distracting to me, so what I do is I zoom into the image, after it comes out of the camera. And I use something called clone. And essentially it is 
copying a piece of the, in this case, the sky, and pasting it over the part of the sky that has the, the dark dot on it. Uh, you can use this for, uh, let's say you're taking a picture of a person and their hair is a little bit messed up. Or, um, you know, they, they had a cut, they had a bandage on. You want to copy some of the nearby skin over the Band-Aid so um, it doesn't show up in the photo. Um, you can adjust color levels. You can make them bolder, you can make them weaker, um, or you can uh, shift the color a little bit. So why would you want to do that? If you take a picture in, a, uh, in an odd lighting situation, let's say uh, fluorescent lights, they're notorious for, uh, for wreaking havoc with your colors, you may want to adjust it a little bit. Um, as I mentioned in the uh, first bullet there, punching up colors on a gray day, I mentioned removing haze with something called curves. It's adjusting the overall exposure. Um, but even then, you may find that the colors just don't pop the way they should, the way they seem to look when you were there, as you recall it. Uh, another one, <clears throat> uh, there's, a, there's a little foible in a lot of lenses, especially inexpensive lenses called chromatic aberration. And very simply, it's that purple fringe that you see on uh, objects that have a very hard edge, and often there's a, a backlighting situation. So a tree branch, for example, may, may show up against a bright sky with a purple fringe around it. That's CA, chromatic aberration. Very annoying, and but easily fixed. You can select the purple and just pull a slider down, it says des desaturate it, and it goes away. It's, uh, it's really kind of a neat tool. Another reason you want, might want to play with the colors is to uh, convert the photo to black and white. Now, you took a color photo, but you're experimenting a little bit, or you think that it will look better in, in black and white. Uh, I will say there are some black and white conversion filters within the GIMP, some pre-programmed filters you could use as well. They will give you not only um, black and white, but they will change the, the contrast and do it in a way that may make it look more authentic uh, than it would if you just desaturate it. So here's an example of a crop. Pardon me while I, uh, I take a quick drink here. So in this example, um, my son was an avid skateboarder at the time. There's a skate park nearby. And uh, he said, Dad, I want you to take my picture. So off we headed to the skate park. The skate park has a uh, deal where you can actually uh, get a photo permit so I could be inside the park and not shooting through the, uh, the steel fence. Gets me up close. Sounded like a, a lot of fun. So my my goal was to catch him doing what he called a board grab. He gets up to the top of this, uh, this pool, and as he exits the top, he uh, does a little bit of a jump, grabs the board, and uh, my, my mission was to try to catch him in action. So the conditions were pretty good. It was great lighting that day. No overcast. We got there early in the morning, so there weren't too many people around. So I didn't have to shoot through uh, other kids. Uh, and as I said, I had access. So then I came home and I started looking at the pictures, and I thought, "Man, this is this is not the picture I'd hoped for." For example, I didn't notice at the time. You tend to fixate on the target, right? I'm trying to look at my son, and I ignore other things. There's this gigantic Halloween poster in the background, and it's got all kinds of bright colors and it just just distracts from the subject. Um, he appears to be missing an arm. Um, one of them is thrust into the poster, the other one is behind him. Uh, I didn't catch his face, that seemed to be pretty important. And there's this annoying element down here on the right, this piece of concrete is kind of jutting into the photo. Now as I'm looking at this, I happen to notice kind of a neat little shadow below it. 
So I played around and I came up with this. So after I cropped the photo, this was the finished product. And you get a sense of the action. Um, you get, a, you know, all of the body parts are uh, on full display in the shadow. Uh, but it gave me a little bit different perspective on it. So in this case, I think I was able to uh, rescue what was probably not a very good photo and make it something a little bit better. Here's one where I combined a couple of, of those simple functions that we talked about earlier. Sharpening and curves being really appropriate for this one. So not too far from me, there is a wildlife sanctuary that is mostly wetlands. And because of that, there are a lot of birds. It's a, it's a great place to go. It is very near the ocean, uh, so it's not uncommon for overcast conditions, especially certain times of the year and especially in the morning. So I'm down there wandering around with uh, the biggest lens I can carry and I'm watching this turn uh, dive into the water trying to catch food. Um, so I'm going to take a picture of the turn. That's, uh, that's my goal. Um, what was wrong with this picture when I got it. I liked it a little, but it was very grainy. I was shooting with a very high ISO rating, and on my camera, that means there's a lot of noise coming off the sensor. I have an older Nikon D200, um, and there are there are many, many cameras better than that camera now. Uh, but um, because the turn was moving very quickly, despite the high ISO rating, um, it was kind of out of focus. Plus, I had some distracting elements. So there are some uh, reeds or something uh, here uh, just destroyed the picture for me. Um, at the time, the conditions were, as I mentioned, overcast. Uh, and certainly, my subject was uncooperative. I had a very hard time getting the bird to stay still so that I could take a picture. So what I did was, first thing I did was I cropped the picture. I moved the bird to the left a little bit. There is um, something called the rule of thirds in photography that uh, uh, is one of the suggestions for composition. Um, and sometimes it makes for a more interesting picture if your subject is not dead center. That's an oversimplification of the rule of thirds. But um, in this case, I thought uh, moving the bird to the other side uh, made it a little better. I'm also left-handed, so maybe that makes something, uh, maybe that has something to do with it. After I cropped it, I used the curves to increase the contrast, to get rid of some of the uh, cloudiness of the sky, make it more white, make the darker parts of the bird darker. Uh, and it also brought out some detail in the feathers that I liked. Uh, the next thing I did was I sharpened it. There are a couple of tools within the GIMP that will allow you to digitally change the way the pixels look in such a way as the image will appear sharper. If you take a very fuzzy picture, you're never going to bring it back into focus, but you can change it in such a way as it appears to be more in focus, and that's what I did here. Uh, as a side note, if you take a grainy picture and sharpen it, it will get more grainy, so it's not always the effect you're looking for. Uh, and the last thing I did was I cloned out the reeds, the distracting parts. So I would grab a section of the sky near there, and I would paste it over top of one of these reeds, uh, making it go away so it wasn't visible even after the crop. So Here's another example of, of a little bit more complicated tool, but very simple to use, something called the perspective tool. Now, this is the Pasadena City Hall. Uh, the Southern California Linux Expo has been uh, held there for the last two years. It's a, it's a wonderful um, structure. Inside, there is a courtyard, and uh, they rent this out for weddings, and it's uh, very common to see people doing photo shoots there. Um, I was walking back to the exhibit hall um, near dusk, and the I just was taken by the 
uh, appearance of the building. So I'm on the other side of a street, which you can't see in this photo, doing um, a shot with my um, 17 to 50 uh, zoom lens, so a bit of a wide angle. And to get all the picture, uh, uh, sorry, get all of the building in the picture, I, I had this thing probably at about 17 millimeters. There is a, a different type of distortion within a lens, especially a wide angle lens, um, that you see here. The palm trees are leaning in. Um, we have some interesting weather in Southern California, but never such that we made a palm tree look like that. And you can see on the edges, parts of the structure are leaning in. So, so we want to correct for that, that pin cushion effect. With the perspective tool, it allows you to essentially imagine this picture being flexible, stretchable, and you would grab the upper corner with your thumb and finger each side and simply pull it apart. And that's what we did. So after changing the perspective, now the palm trees are vertical. Um, the trade-off in this case was I, I lost the corners of the building and I also changed the uh, dimensions a little bit. I made it a little bit fatter. But in this case, I thought it made it look a little bit better. So here's the before and after using the perspective tool. Raw files. <clears throat> so if you are not familiar, um, we'll go back to the beginning of the presentation. We talked a little bit about file formats, JPEG being the most common. Um, a modern digital camera outputs a very high resolution picture. It's, it's a big file. There's a lot of information in there. There's information about when you took it, if you have a GPS unit connected to it, typically on a cell phone. Uh, if you don't defeat that for pictures, it will embed that information. It will tell you what the camera is, what the lens is, all kinds of good stuff about your picture, your exposure. Um, it, it's also an uncompressed raw image, hence the name, right off the sensor. No processing has been done. Um, your camera, especially if you have a, a digital single lens reflex camera, a DSLR, it will do some processing, whether it's Canon, Nikon, Sony, there's some processor in there, microprocessor, that will um, do some conversions in a way that the manufacturer thinks will provide you with a good high quality image. So it changes it a little bit, but mostly it compresses it. It makes it manageable in terms of size. What happens though, is during that compression, you lose information. Um, the most common loss that you will experience is shadow detail. So if you work from the raw image versus working from a JPEG, you have a lot more flexibility in terms of the final output, particularly if you have a picture that has some very dark areas. If you have a JPEG with dark areas and you lighten them, you'll get a muddy kind of less dark area. If you start from your raw file and there's detail in the dark area, when you lighten it, that detail is still there. To work with a raw file, you need some conversion software. You either have to um, use what the manufacturer provided. And in my case, as I said, I have a Nikon. Nikon gives you a little CD and they give you a utility program that will allow you to convert from raw to um, JPEG or whatever else you're doing. Um, and it will give you some basic editing capabilities. Um, in this case, we're going to, we're going to use a different kind of plugin rather than using the uh, file conversion system that Nikon gives me because it's much more powerful. And uh, the Nikon program only runs on Windows and I don't use Windows very often. Um, another reason to use um, the raw file is for white balance. I mentioned shooting in a fluorescent light area earlier on. 
Um, it's, it's very common to have a, f a photo when you're shooting indoors. Um, auditoriums, for example, the lighting is off. Um, whether it's, lately it's LEDs, but uh, in the old days, fluorescence or maybe mercury vapor. Um, inside, you don't quite know what you're going to get. So you take the picture home, you take it out of the camera, you look at it on your PC, and it's like, wow, that car was blue when I took that picture, but man, it looks kind of purplish now. So we go to the RAW file. I use something called UF RAW. It is an open source project that is designed to work with RAW files either independently as a command line or as a plugin for the GIMP. And here's what it looks like. If you can see it right here, we've got a default menu uh, for camera. Uh, this is where Nikon has told us via information embedded in the raw file that this is what it thinks the white balance should be based on the scene and the fact that my camera was set for auto white balance. I didn't have any pre-programmed setting in the camera. You can change that. You, you have a number of preset cloudy day, sunlight, flash, uh, fluorescent, those kinds of things. You have some presets on that little drop down. Or you got these cool sliders here that will allow you to make the picture warmer or cooler until you feel that it's appropriate. This is also an area where you can do some fun things like reducing the noise level. And I mentioned shooting at a high ISO and getting some noise. Um, right here, you can see a little slider called denoise. And it will remove some of that graininess that exists in the picture if that's not the effect you're looking for. Sometimes grainy is good. Um, it also softens the picture. So there's there's always a, uh, a give and take on these kinds of things. Uh, so you you may not uh, want to denoise too much. Uh, a lot of these other functions allow you to make very specific changes to the photo, things like uh, not just the temperature, but the color balance. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of features that, frankly, I don't use very often, but um, give you that flexibility that I spoke of. And when you're finished, you down here and click OK, and at that point, it converts it into a file that will display in the GIMP, and now you can start doing the other things that you would typically do. Uh, for example, crop, uh, rotate, those sorts of things. So this is one where I started doing some complex things. Um, a very common uh, complaint I have about my photos is I'm trying to shoot on a, on a bright, sunny day. And, um, you know, for, for those of you who do this fairly often, you know about the golden hour, right? There's a, a window in the morning and a window in the evening where the sun is at a really good angle. And you don't have to worry so much about that over bright sky. You get some really nice long shadows. You get some very nice colors. The colors are typically very saturated, but you can't always shoot when the, when the light is right. So I go out hiking and there's an area very close to my house called Red Rock Canyon. And we've got some fun sandstone formations there. And I'm trying to take a picture of this and I want the rocks to be properly exposed. If they're underexposed, I don't get the, the uh, colors right. If they're overexposed, we lose that red cast. And the sky is never cooperative. So what I did using a tutorial was to first create a layer. Many of the terms in photo editing come from the old days when we were using dark rooms and enlargers and things like layers and masks and so on were literal. But in this case, we simply create a copy of the picture. We operate on that copy and then we kind of merge it together digitally to make a different picture. So in this case, what I did 
is I, I made a copy of the picture, made sort of a semi-transparent copy, made part of it really dark, the sky part, and part of it really light, the rock part, as best I could. This was sort of a, a first pass approach, and then sandwiched them together. So it, effectively, it made the sky darker. Uh, it left the rock alone for the most part. It did change the color balance a little bit. But at the end, I got a photo I was much happier with. So, as I mentioned, there are many, many um, sources for additional information on the GIMP. If you take a look at these in particular, the GIMP itself, um, docs.gimp.org is probably your best uh, resource. Their wiki is also excellent. And on GIMP.org, these are community contributed tutorials. Um, people who are just like us um, looking for a way to, to solve a problem, uh, they found a good way and they created a tutorial. Sometimes it's a video, sometimes it's uh, simply a set of instructions. And uh, it is from one of these that I found the instructions to do the um, layer mask that we did in the previous slide. So take a look at those, see if they give you some ideas. Uh, and certainly if you have any questions about the GIMP uh, today, be happy to answer those. Uh, and if we don't get them answered today, I'm happy to uh, answer them as best I can via email later. Now, at this point, I had hoped to do a live demo. Um, I mentioned Murphy's Law earlier. Uh, I had some hardware issues, and uh, so I'm, we're working on a backup of a backup right now. <laughs> so live demo is probably not in the offing, but if any of your questions relate to uh, something I can demonstrate on the GIMP, I, I was happy to uh, bring it up and, and give it a go. Uh, at this point, John, please open the floor for questions, and I'm happy to speak to anybody who has a question. Yeah, we've, we've got some questions that have come in. Uh, the, one of them was wanting to know whether or not GIMP is going to be able or able to be downloaded on an Android tablet. I do not know of an Android um, port at this point. Um, so I'm, I'm almost 100% sure the answer is no. It would be great. Um, the GIMP is a little bit resource hungry, um, so lots of memory, lots of CPU are helpful when you're doing photo editing, particularly if you're doing a lot of layers. So let's say, for example, um, a file from my camera is five megabytes, and I make, um, one of the things you can do with the GIMP is kind of fun. I used to do this often when my uh, oldest son was pitching uh, for the high school baseball team, I would take six or seven shots of him pitching, and then I would create an animated GIF file from that. So he got a chance to, without the benefit of a video camera, see his form, and, and it also made for some, you know, just some fun pictures. Um, you can very easily get a very, very large file doing things like that. So uh, it may not be easy to do on a tablet, but uh, no, I don't think you can use it on Android. Okay, turn that off. Um, we had somebody who was so excited they went to uh, download it and not having seen your resource, mm -hmm. they went to GIMP.com Ah, downloaded GIMP, but thanks to their malware bites, uh -huh. it uh, flagged it and wouldn't let them do it because there was a very strange file when he wrote down what it was. And so we see from your demo that it's the GIMP.org is is the uh, true website correct yeah um, there's always somebody that wants to take advantage huh <laughs> oh absolutely absolutely so uh and as you said you know you can get it for the uh, cross-platform uh, are the uh do you know whether or not the uh controls or the the gui screen is pretty much the same both for all the the uh, cross-platform 
So if you use it in one, it's pretty easy to use it in the other. It's almost identical. I've seen almost no differences between them and none that would cause you to go, hmm, what function is that? Yeah, it, it's, that's one of the things that I like about it the best. The folks that have ported it um, or compiled it for the different platforms did a great job. Oh, okay. Uh, somebody wanted to know, they, they were interested in your uh, UF RAW. Where do you go to get that? Good question. And I believe it's ufraw.org. Um, I was going to break out of this and, and do a quick Google, but let's not do that. Um, uh, if you Google UF RAW, uh, it should be pretty easy to find. It's an open source project. Um, I believe there are also links to it on gimp.org. And it's just a plug-in that gets added to GIMP so that you can use it that way? Correct. Uh, for me, I actually, um, on Linux, I download the source code, compile it, and create a Slackware package and then install it. But uh, effectively, it just simply is a plug-in to the GIMP. Good. Camera question that you might be able to do. Sure. Uh, we have a, a viewer who has a Nikon D7100 with mm -hmm. several options for raw shooting. Okay. We'd like to be able to start doing that with what you've said, but not quite sure which selection I should choose. Um, I'm not sure what raw settings are available on a 7100. On my camera, I have, um, I have three resolutions, I think, uh, normal, reg, uh, medium, and fine, or something like that, and that's simply um, uh, the compression of the JPEG. Um, I can shoot raw plus JPEG, only raw, or only JPEG. I think those are the options that I have. Um, I'll tell you what I do. I shoot raw plus JPEG. It burns up a lot of the uh, flash card uh, quickly, but it gives me the most flexibility. So if I have a good, well-exposed JPEG, I'll just work on that typically. If I need to fix something, I'll go back to the raw file and, and work from that. Yeah, and, and I think with the uh, price of uh, like SD cards and such really coming down, there there's no uh, probably really concern of filling up or running out of room. And then you have the best of both, yep. as you said. Exactly. Okay. I'm kind of checking to see if we have any other questions from our okay. viewers. Um, um, while you're looking, if, uh, if anybody can chime in, um, how many people have tried the GIMP? Uh, and if you have, um, what was your reaction? You know, give me a one to 10 kind of a thing. I, I hated it. I couldn't find my way around um, or, you know, I loved it, uh, but haven't dug it out in a while and maybe I'll go back and try it. Uh, I'd be curious. Um, there are a lot of folks that are using um, Adobe's Elements, Photoshop Elements, uh, successfully. Even um, you know basic uh, Windows, and certainly on the Mac, there are there are native tools that will allow you to do some of the basic functions that we discussed here. Uh, what drew me to the GIMP is the advanced functions. So even though I don't do a lot of white balance adjustments in a given day, when you need them. They sure are handy. Good. In any of the editing that you've done, uh, have you found that GIMP doesn't do something that you want it to do? Um, I have not used Adobe Photoshop, but my in reading about the tool, one of the things that uh, professionals do very often is they have kind of a workflow. Um, they're able to automate the process and uh, the GIMP doesn't do that. Now, if, if you're pretty good with Linux, you can probably script these kinds of things. And I have done some scripting. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, I took a bunch of pictures at a SoCal Linux Expo a few years ago um, and I had misset the flash, and I wasn't really paying attention to the, uh, to the the screen on the back of the camera, so I shot a whole bunch of pictures that didn't weren't exposed properly. Um, so I had to adjust the exposure for I don't know, let's say 50 pictures. Not a fun prospect. Most 
things in Linux are based, most applications I should say, are based on a low-level library, including the GIMP. It uses a library called Image, Image Magic. Mm -hmm. It's a very powerful library, and it includes all kinds of, of functions that will operate on pixels. But if you had to do it via command line, you'd drive yourself crazy, or for at least most of us. Um, in this case, I was able to find the command lines, tinker with it a little bit, and then um, write a quick script that would operate on all 50 files and change the exposure, essentially applying a curve to it um, in 10 seconds and, and life was good. So, But to answer your question, the workflow is probably one thing that people will miss most in uh, Photoshop or moving from something like Photoshop. Um, I also would like um, a better HDR, high dynamic range uh, plugin. There are a couple out there that have been written for it. Um, they only work with uh, three images. I'd like to be able to do it with five or seven. Oh, okay. And, and HDR, for those of you who don't know, your eye has the ability to resolve an amazing range of light from very dark to very bright um, your camera doesn't uh, but you can simulate that by taking multiple images at different exposures and sandwiching them together in the extreme that's what astronomers do to get these wonderful pictures uh, through a telescope that otherwise might just see a blur in the sky so high dynamic range helps you uh, get those pictures where you have the red rock with the bright sun, for example. Um, but yeah, HDR plugin is something that I wish we had on the GIMP that we don't. Yeah, and there's somebody in open source that will probably try to work on that. Uh, no doubt. One, one good positive thing, we had somebody said that they hadn't uh, tried GIMP yet, but because of your presentation, they're excited about it, and they will be checking it out. Uh, one last thing before we run out of time. Uh, one person said that they they liked it, but they've always had some trouble with layers and, and selection tools, uh, mm -hmm. not getting what they wanted. Uh, do you know offhand, uh, under that tutorial website, would they be able to find some good uh, help step-by-steps from there? I was. Um, one of the uh, tutorials that I looked at to uh, to uh, operate on the rock picture uh, discusses creating new layers and uh, applying functions to those layers and that was very helpful to me uh, when I first started doing this I really didn't uh, doing this that is working with the GIMP and, and doing some photo editing um, I had no idea what a layer was I, I saw some guy on um, was, what was it called, Tech TV or something uh, 100 years ago, playing with Photoshop and doing all these really cool creative things. And he'd create, he'd uh, make a new mask, uh, two or three, and, and uh, turn this photo into something amazing. Um, so I wanted to learn more, but um, didn't until I got into the GIMP and started understanding a little bit about how it works. So yes, I think the tutorials will be very helpful. Uh, and the GIMP wiki, I think, will also... Uh, be a good place to, to spend some time. Great. Dennis, I want to thank you for being able to put up with your troubles at home and not <laughs> being able to do everything that you wanted to do. No but problem. I do think uh, everybody got an idea of uh, what GIMP can do. Uh, I know that one person said they thought it was a little bit too difficult to use and, and they were getting by with Picasa, mm -hmm. but that's going to go on the wayside since uh, Google is moving everybody over to their photos. So right. as long as he can or she can use it, uh, that's that's great. But uh, getting into GIMP, you can start low and, and then keep working your way. Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's a good starting point. Um, there are a lot of features, but uh, start with one that you're comfortable with, and I think eventually you'll be um, uh, successful with the tool. I right. wish you all well. Um, I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy days uh, to listen to this, and I hope you are uh, able to find an open source program that works for you, particularly the GIMP.